Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic to uh, talk to my friends, learn something, have a good time. And um, it's been going on a lot longer than I expected. Um, so this, I think, is a number 126 or 7 in the webinar series. And today I have my guests once again from Equisoma, um, uh, Diane Dezingle and Pam Eckelberger. And this is your third webinar, right? Was this is the third one? It is the third. Yeah. yeah, it's the third one. It's awesome. And um, just so you know, like some of the description that I had on the website about what this webinar is going to be about is not accurate and will not happen. But it's going to be a really exciting and really interesting webinar because anytime these ladies get a hold of bones, we're going to learn something. So <laughs> um, I'm sure you don't mind if we kind of shift topic a little bit and. Um, well, we're just going to turn it over to these guys because because uh, Pam actually told me she's got a lot to cover today. So welcome, Pam and Diane. Thank you so much for coming back. Thank you. Thanks for having here. Sorry for the mix up and not being able to. Okay. Oh, that's okay. And you guys have been off doing some digging while we since we last talked to you. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Yep. yep. So can you tell us a little bit about what you were up to up there? Just kind of like where you go and what 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 you do there. Well, that's, that's part of my presentation. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Don't yeah. jump the gun, Wendy. Don't jump the gun. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe just tell us a little bit about Equisoma, just for those people who haven't heard about you guys before, just to get us started, and then we'll get right into your presentation. Okay. Um, just to clarify, Equisoma is the name of the business that I started when I was doing body work, and I retain that. I don't do body work quite so much. I used to do the bones. Um, the osteology anatomy anatomy learning center is um co-founded and co-run by myself and diane Ziegel next to me and diane has her own body working business called back and balance it's my body work yep so um just that just clarifies things as far as the naming goes and we um connected a few years ago with an interest same interest in learning about anatomy and bones i had dug up my own horse and was learning a lot from his skeleton and it just kind of snowballed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what what keeps us going is the amazing pathologies that we're seeing, and both expected and unexpected, and mysterious, and and all of the questions that result from all of these things that we found that I, we don't really know who to go to for answers, but. Um, we just keep looking at bones and trying to make correlations. Yeah, what, what we're what we're focusing on pretty much in the last year or so is uh, not only just looking at the bones, but correlating with the horse's history. Um, what's, what's that? I just spotlighted you guys, so you're oh. bigger. <laughs> I'm far away from the screen, so I can't see what things are on there. I'll move up closer when I do the presentation thing. So. Um, yeah, so we um, so now we're we're going a little more in depth with um, learning about the horses' history, um, their discipline, breeding, uh, on and on, and any problems and issues that they had in their life. And then when, if and when we get the bones, then we see what pathology shows us. Um, right? Yeah, we're a little yeah. short in that we what we really would like to include is dissection. <laughs> Diane keeps pushing us in that direction. And well, we feel like we find so many things with the bones, but and we've never found a skeleton that didn't have major pathology that could be potentially linked to the behavioral issues or performance issues that people had. Um, realizing that all of these horses uh, that have been our case studies have extensive diagnostics that have been unsubstantiated, uh, like they could not figure out what the problem was. Um, but we're also missing all of the soft tissue. You know, there could have been organ issues. There could have obviously been muscle, tendon, ligament, etc. There could be brain tumors. You know, there's so many things that we're missing in the compost process that we'd love a chance to uh, be able to go through these horses in a dissection. Okay. Beforehand. Yeah. So that takes it to the whole next level. Uh, of, uh, I'll tell yeah. my husband. We need another. <laughs> Cold room being down here in Aiken and cold storage, and then we need more land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Yeah. 
she's young. So, so just out of curiosity, how long have you, when did you dig up your first skeleton? I dug up Petey in 20, my, my, my poster, 2016. He was so, so you guys have collected all these bones in about four years. Yeah, it really started rolling probably about three years ago when I um, was introduced to um, Michelle at Compassionate Composting in Maine. And right. And Maine in the summer, we have a farm up there, and um, she is, is wonderful. She loves, she works for a vet. She's fascinated in pathology as, as well. She just doesn't have time to study it. And she, with owner's permission, is a source of some of these bones. So, and have, um, have you had any contact with any veterinarians that are curious or interested in knowing what you found in the bones from that, the, the vet that treated that horse? Has that connection been made? Yes, we have one, one or two in particular. Yeah. Um, uh, one local vet especially who has been awesome and has been actually kind of working with us um, when we are suspicious, suspecting uh, the C67 malformation in a horse that he will... Um, the owner will convince the owner to have him do the x-rays, he'll do those, and he's been really wonderful. He now understands what's going on. Uh, one of the horses that we composted down here and just dug up two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, he's going to be kind of our bonus material he'll be, today. He'll be our last item to, to, <laughs> to tease you with. Um, and this horse had extensive work up with this veterinarian. So when we pulled the bones out and told him what, what preliminary findings were, the vet was like, wow. They, you know, it just, it answers a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I, you know, for, I know the AAP is coming up and I'm kind of working toward that because I'm going to have a virtual booth, but I just think that for veterinarians to, to start to have ways to understand what you're discovering in the bones in relation to what they've been dealing with, I think that this is a, a, a hugely untapped area, but that can really help a lot of diet, you know vets working with horses like this and owners who have these horses yeah. um well, we, so, one thing we say to the local vets or whenever i have them over here to look at my horses um is i drag them in here and i say this is a resource for you guys you know use it as a resource if you know you can't remember everything from your vet, your vet school about anatomy if you want a refresher or you're looking at an issue come on over we got we got textbooks we've got quite a library here um, and yes, what ultimately what we really, um, one of the things we really like doing, especially with, with that down here, is he gets the x-rays and then we show him the bones to the x-ray so he can then correlate what he's seeing. There's a lot of things they can't see with the regular diagnostics. Right. Um, we have another one that should be coming out of compost later this winter that also was a recommendation from a, a relatively local vet who did extensive work on a horse for, I think, years, and they just could not get to the bottom of it. And so, you know, that's where we started talking about being able to do the dissection, because if we don't find anything in the bones, then we'll feel like we missed something. But, you know, like I said, so far we haven't found something pretty major. Yeah, but she had the x-ray. She, she, like, she, she, yeah, she, she showed some, uh, she showed, uh, we think, the malformation in C67, so that'll be interesting. And, and, just to kind of tease everybody, I have Sharon May Davis as a guest in December. So, really, <laughs> I've been working on on that one for a while, and I'm I've got her um, to uh, to come on the show. I think it's December third. It's her fourth, our third. Anyway, I'll put out an email about that. We'll get that up on the website and all that. Stuff. Because I think that that is a a hugely under diagnosed problem yeah yeah well she's she's bringing it to the limelight but and and everything else she talks about is is really really very very educational for everyone to learn so she doesn't but she doesn't get out there that much at least over here so that'd be great right yeah so all right well take it away we'll get into your presentation all right okay awesome. i'm gonna move up here i'm gonna be vanna she's vanna <laughs> Somebody's got to be the brains and somebody's got to show the bones. So. Awesome. All right, let's see if we can do this stupid screen sharing thing. I made my cursor really big so everybody can see it, including me. All right, screen share. Post disabled attendees. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Don't do that to me. I got it. I just, well, I, you know, 
I forgot to make you a co-host. There we go. Make you a co-host. Good. You're good. Oh, smooth. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Now everyone hold your breath that the program doesn't crash. But if it does, we'll try it again. Yeah, we can, we'll just restart. Hold your breath. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you jinxed it. <laughs> try it a few more times. Yep. Ah. So um, while Pam's getting that sorted out, if anybody has a horse that they had that they could not resolve what the issues, um, just put that in the chat, you know. And Pam's gonna get her PowerPoint up. Yeah. Uh, this happened before. I might actually have to read it. Um, we did it about three times a while ago. And then it started working. We're we're hoping that it's gonna work now, right? We're really hoping it's gonna work. Uh, Deanna says she needs to start composting. <laughs> I tell you, it's tricky. It's tricky. We we're, can we're learning things about that too. Yeah, yeah. I think that's not as simple as people think. Um, no, it's really not. Especially when you're when you're wanting to have something at the end of the story to look at you know i mean it's, it's one thing to just oops. well that's it. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the um interesting things we've had happen with a couple of horses just out of the blue like we've pulled a lot of horses out of compost and all of a sudden there's been a couple in a row that um are not the bones are not behaving the way we would like them to okay do you see it no because you haven't screen shared yet i did <laughs> It started. I don't want to stop it. Okay. Just, well, you can just, um, I know. I know. Move it over so you can get to, there we go. There we go. Good job. Right, but now let's hope it opens. Yep. Fingers. Yes. That's all all right. No, that's not, that's not the one I want to be on. <laughs> okay. It's working, right? There we go. All right. So, um, yeah, that's just a cover banner. We don't need to see. Where's my mouse? I, I see your mouse. I lost my mouse. Oh, there you are. Right there. It's in the middle of your in of your PowerPoint. Hey now, where's my wine? And we're gonna get going. <laughs> and I think you could just probably use your your right left keys on your keyboard to move it. Well, then I have to reach up and be right. I'm I'm back here with the. Oh okay. My mouse. I can't so. see you anymore. All I see is your screen. Okay, so how we spend our summer vacation? That's that's part of the key of what's going on. This is how I spent the summer vacation. I was in Maine from August through October, and I was working my you-know-what off. This was pretty much my home territory, the Compassionate Composting Facility in Auburn, Maine, which is about an hour and 15 minutes from me, owned by Michelle, and I can never pronounce her last name. Hola, bro. Hola, <laughs> was awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle, for helping us with all this. Um, she takes care of the uh, composting of horses that are donated to us. Um, so and those are what she calls windrows. And these are these are windrows. Yeah, this this is uh, this probably holds about well, it's hard with the camera, but probably ten or twelve horses, all kind of lined up. Um, so uh, that's where I spent. I dug up four horses, sort of, from there for the summer, and it takes me when I'm alone, which I was about a day or day and a half, and um, then I also. Can we move us? Yes, I mean, I've moved you out of the way, but you you haven't done that on your screen. So you can oh. just move us wherever you like. Oh, okay, so, so oh, there we go. yeah, but there's other things. Going on. We'll get rid of Wendy, there we go. <laughs> so I also got to um, recover bones of two other horses who were sort of serendipitously um, donated to me. And those were actually um, in the backyard of my friend's farm. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend's husband came out and helped me. And so those are two others that I got. And then the long, long process of washing, cleaning, scrubbing, changing water. So I was, this is pretty much my summer. And then I also set up um, in my barn up there, a little uh, learning center north branch. So I brought Apollo up. I brought a couple other um, uh, skeleton, one other skeleton, and then representative stories of the C67, growth plates, yada yada, so that 
the people who can't come down here to Aiken um, could come and visit and I gave little presentations and it was a lot of fun because I had people like two ladies came from three hours away in Massachusetts um, a lot of old friends because I was in Maine from 1991 um, until now <laughs> and so i had a lot of a lot of friends and it was like old home week but they got to see what i was doing with the bones diane on the other hand <laughs> <laughs> i came up to maine on vacation it was so fun yeah cool <laughs> Harborside <laughs> Dungeons. this is what diane did there we went I, kayaking, kayaking <laughs> main coast sightseeing this is funny because Pam showed me this whole I thought presentation <laughs> yesterday, but she left all of this out. She's telling on me. Rock climbing. Everybody should visit Maine. Collecting it's rose hips. So <laughs> spectacular. My horses have eaten the rose hips as part of their free liver cleanse, by the way. Don't go down that side. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, this was when she actually came up to, to help me for a while. And other than that, she was down here in humid hot horrible Aiken, Aiken County. She continued on with working on horses um, and then she perfected her bone articulating. <laughs> what a cool! Oh, yeah. She's getting really, we'll have to show you the one that we're done with. Drilling, drilling holes through the long bones, putting together, re-articulating limbs that move because she uses tubing instead of um, glue. Wow. Studying, of course, for her upcoming osteo equine osteopathy um, courses <laughs> with, her, with her study buddy there. <laughs> and then when she was in Maine, um, when she wasn't out gallivanting around uh, being a um, uh, sightseer, uh, I put her to work, obviously, <laughs> cleaning bones. Great. And, um, she did the gross stuff, like washing the brains out of skulls. So she got some work in there, too. So contrary to popular belief um we're not randomly digging up skeletons as you can see by these photos that i took just a couple days ago in front of the learning center my wash stall back of the barn <laughs> and the tack room <laughs> we don't have room for for bones we are totally overwhelmed um trying to deal with them all so but in our dealings with well, let me say, there's a method to our madness of collecting bones, and that's to continue collecting anatomical evidence that correlates with physical and behavioral issues that horse owners and their veterinarians often struggle to figure out. And in our dealings with visitors to the Learning Center, Diane with her clients um, for body work and whatnot, um, we hear these same stories over and over and over again, recurring owner complaints. About, the, about their horses, physical issues that start to surface. The horse starts out being really nice, everything's great, and then physical issues start to surface, become difficult to resolve, such as mystery lameness, ulcers, abscesses, musculoskeletal complaints, difficulty picking up and holding canter leads, yada yada to that. Chiropractic acupuncture, body work, and physio does nothing, or it doesn't hold for very long. Veterinary diagnoses can often be extensive and obviously very expensive, but they're inconclusive. And the biggie that fits in with the complaints is behavior. Behavioral changes can be sometimes overnight. The behavior becomes erratic. The horse is good one day, not the next. They're hypersensitive to touching or grooming, react negatively, being tacked up, mouthy and or girthy. Reluctant to move forward, that's a very common one, on the lunge or under saddle. Overly spooky and bolting, bucking, rearing when lunged under saddle or under saddle. Difficult for the farrier, doesn't want to keep holding up a foot. And aggressive towards people and other animals. The last thing is, in many cases, euthanasia is the only ethical solution. So all of these, um, characteristics of the stories that we hear over and over really over and over again I can't yeah. emphasize that enough from horse owners uh, we sort of put into kind of a profile and this is the type of horse that we're looking for to then examine get their full history and then examine the bones and this is what we kind of nicknamed the Apollo profile so um, let's see so just to, just to um, kind of a 
review of Apollo for those who aren't familiar with them, but I think the whole world is by now. <laughs> Uh, this was Apollo, an off-the-track thoroughbred, um, who was owned by Eva McGuire in Maine, a friend of mine, and she purchased him in 2016. He had been off the track for a bit, never raced, and two years later, she euthanized him. After making the heart-wrenching decision to humanely euthanize her eight-year-old Apollo in October of 2018, Eva asked if I would recover his bones because she sent him to the Compassionate Composting to see if they might provide some answers to the dramatic change in his behavior, which had become difficult and sometimes dangerous in the last year of his life. And this is a quote from Eva. He made progress and then he didn't. One day he could be okay and the next was not. We tried to fix him, really we did. We spent six months on groundwork alone. He got better for maybe a month, then he completely lost his mind and became extremely aggressive and dangerous. The details of Apollo are on my website equisoma.com, Apollo, and you don't have to do final chapter, but that's kind of a review. So we did what she asked. We dug up his bones a year after she composted them, and we were very surprised at what we found, but we did find a pathology that we thought would explain a lot of this, and um, that's what you find in the whole report here. You know, I was going to chime in one thing really quick, that one of the things we also hear over and over again from horse owners that have these sort of profiles is, and this is true in Eva's case, uh, the sort of, I don't know if I want to call it peer pressure or the lack of understanding from their peers that, you know, the people that said, you know, it's, it's just a red mare, the horse is young, it's naughty, it's this. You just want your mama's life, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll just repeat it, go ahead, keep going. Uh, right. <laughs> I think the peer pressure thing is what stands out in my mind yeah. is how many of my body work clients have been like, you know, my, my friends all just tell me to get a different trainer or that I need to just get tougher with them or put them in a, a different program. And, and so it's that sort of getting answers and feeling like you have closure that you had to euthanize this horse with no answers, except for that you just couldn't, the quality of life for both human and horse was not worth Right. hanging on to yeah so okay next slide sorry <laughs> you're allowed to talk <laughs> you might be no. I think it's such a such an important point because we can let ourselves get bullied by people we think of as experts to do things oh, that okay. we know in our heart aren't right but we don't know what's wrong yeah yeah and this yeah. this is because we um eva allowed us I and mean, she's fantastic about getting this information out there and she gave me uh, pages of of quotes the things that she had you know her memories of her dealings with them which i used in the write-up for the report um and and of course we had facebook page and a group page and lots i don't know how we're, how many thousands of people we're up to now but so many of the people are coming out saying i've got a horse just like this mm -hmm. and she's really helped a lot of people um, stop with the, you know, end the guilt and the sadness that goes with making that decision. So, so we've been offered a lot of horses to dig up and look at skeletons, but like I pointed out, we don't have room for every horse. So the horses that fall into this profile are the ones we've been accepting for our, our study <clears throat> of correlating physical behavioral issues with osseous pathologies. And again, a reminder that unfortunately there is a soft tissue, a visceral aspect to things that we can't cover. Um, yes. It's just yet. <laughs> so ponder this. As with, you, as with us, the horse's body develops pathologies through the process of just living, living life and aging. However, would the pathologies we see in the skeletons of older horses have been less severe if the horse had not been started at a young age and or asked to do things their bodies are not structurally designed to do? In other words, pushing them beyond anatomical limits. Like us, horses will tolerate some discomforts they have to for survival and go about their lives. Sooner or later, however, if not addressed, these mild discomforts turn into nagging chronic pain that can lead to compensations that in turn can lead to more discomfort and pain. So the only communication horses have is their body language and behavior. Yet what do we see when we see a horse acting up and behaving? We see a naughty horse, right? So what if some horses are born with a genetic or genetic mutations 
that affect the body's symmetry and balance from day one, from when, when they're born. This is what we kind of call the naughty horse syndrome that Diane already introduced us to. <laughs> so how many, you know, how many people, he, this, is, this is sound familiar to a lot of our listeners out there, right? He's just being naughty. It's a mare thing. That was my mare, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he's young he'll grow out of it she's just testing you you need a stronger bit bigger spurs he she needs to be in a program needs to work harder find another trainer yada 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 add what you want um, this is just a few of the things we hear over and over and over again but I so, think one of the things that's consistent is that the the people you're hearing it from have tried as many different things as they can to solve it because there are just like people we all have naughty moments you know but it's the consistent pattern i think that i just want to emphasize here it is, it is and and yet horses brains are not designed like ours so they don't have the frontal lobe that plans and schemes and analyzes things they live for the moment and their their moment is to survive so being naughty really isn't a word in their vocabulary. Um, being, being how they need to be behaviorized with body language to influence other horses, yeah, but. I guess what I'm trying to say is um, you've, you've got to look at the patterns in the horse that there are moments when we have bad days, but it's the, this is the, cons the sort of consistent patterns um, where horses are blamed as being naughty. I mean, yeah. we all have a bad day once in a while. <laughs> well, the other contributing factor that may have nothing to do with any sort of uh, pathology is that they just don't understand. I think that horses yeah. can act out because they don't understand what's being asked of them. So that's a whole, you know, another little rabbit hole. Um, and that's that's just that I'm just trying to point out is that when we have these behaviors, it's our job to start trying to figure out what they're trying to communicate to us. But when you're seeing horses with consistently problematic behaviors, like you're describing, like in Apollo's case, where she tried everything, we need to start because sometimes it can be just a, you know a badly fitting saddle that somebody put on right. the horse one day and right. suddenly he has a right. behavioral issue, and we have to address that. So it's that's all I'm trying to say. Um, so, so in many cases, horses do just fine. You know, we, we do what we can with their feet, their, their tack fit, riding, and they do, they do just fine. Others, a lot of it, I think, depends on their history. Yeah. Their yeah. So, so, so we ended up coming up with a good horse and a bad, we didn't come up with a good horse and a bad body, but essentially this is what, how we view this kind of horse, is they really can't help it if they have the bad body. And I have to give credit to this, um, quote to Emily Merrill. She's a friend of mine from Maine. She, her mother is Polly Merrill, who donated a horse to us, um, Mikey. Uh, about three years ago, he's the only other horse besides Petey that I actually dug up from the ground, not composted. And Mikey had very, very similar issues to this kind of syndrome thing, to the point that, that Emily, apparently, and, and I'm trying to remember it, how Polly told me the story, but Emily never really liked handling him. She, she was always complaining that he wouldn't stand in the cross tie and he was biting and this, that, and other thing. And she, she just was pretty snarky about poor Mikey. But then when it got to the point where I think they had decided to euthanize him for behavior and whatnot, Polly said she was having coffee in the morning and Emily came downstairs in tears. And she said, Mama, I had a dream last night and Mikey came to me and he said, please don't be mad at me. I'm just a good horse in a bad body. So I've, we borrowed that quote. <laughs> Ooh, that gives you shivers, okay? Because <laughs> it fits, but it really does fit. Yeah. So, all right, so, okay, so I just want to read one comment because I think this is really important for you to hear. Um, Monique says it sounds very familiar and she's crying in relief listening to you guys. They went through the same struggle. Luckily, we eventually found a vet to help us get to the bottom of our horse's pain. And so, you know, you're already doing good work. I just want you to know that. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> well, I'm glad she was able to find, find answers. That's always a good thing to hear. So let's get on to some phones. 
So this is going to be kind of a, um, a lecture on what to look for. What kinds of things do we look for when we dig up a skeleton as far as normal, pathology, whatnot? And there's categories. The first thing that we really look at is, gen is certain things that are genetic mutations. In other words, the horse is born with it. And like Apollo was born with his problem. So one of the first items we look at is the cervicals. This is ECVM, equine complex vertebral malformation, which on December 3rd slash 4th, when Sharon May Davis is with you, she will talk about because she is the lady who brought this out in publications um, starting in 2014. Um, and is continuing to work on the project along with a slew of others. So I'm going to cover this very briefly. We'll show a few bones um, just so you can see what they look like, but it is an anomaly that has been becoming more and more frequently found um, in not only thoroughbreds, but warm bloods, quarter horses, on and on and on. And so what we're looking at is this area in the neck the malformation involves the ventral or the, you know, the underneath side of C6 and sometimes C7, sometimes first and second ribs. This is a very important junction because it's the base of the neck, right, where, where the neck joins into the, thoracic, the thoracic or the backbone. And so this is an area that needs a lot of stability. This is a normal. C6, we're looking at the bottom of it, the ventral surface. This is the head direction, tail direction. These two structures on left or right are, the, are on only C6. The other vertebrae don't have these. And in the normal situation, these are equal length, left and right. And they look pretty similar, though we find a lot of variation to this theme. They're very important because they hold muscles that stabilize the neck that run from uh, higher up as well as from the thoracics and they attach to these areas here. This is C7 looking kind of head on into it, a little bit of a ventral, it's smaller, it's wing shape. It's, this is a normal appearance of C7. There's two little tubercles down here for, for muscle attachment, but things are symmetrical. What Sharon May Davis found, however, in dissections of thousands of horses, if we're looking at the ventral surface of C6 and C7, notice the yellow circle. The bone is missing here that should be right there. So this is what she calls a unilateral absence of this part of the ventral tubercle. So imagine where do those muscles attach to this area. And in this case, C7 is fairly normal. It's still asymmetrical. The tubercles are a little bit different shape, but this is the major component. Another variation, again, missing. And it can be left or right um, sides. Missing here, just like it is here, and it should be here on C6. But in this case, that part of the tubercle transposed or grew on C7. So now C7 doesn't have it normally, but here it is here. So this is a gen genetic mutation, the genes responsible for building these vertebrae essentially screwed up. <laughs> okay, so again, think of the muscle attachments, think of the nerves, the blood vessels. And the second paper that Sharon wrote is about the dissection, looking at the muscles and the asymmetries involved. Well, and you can see at the, the ventral line there yeah. that it is not straight. So there's also the a lot whole of pull. Yeah. base of the neck is not sitting straight the way it should be. Right. And then another um, variation is when both, this is C6, but it looks like C5, both of those tubercles, left and right, are missing and they've transposed onto C7. This is a bilateral transposition. This actually is one that the veterinarian we were talking about found for us with x-rays when we were suspicious that this horse, because of his history, his behavior, his diagnostics, we were sus suspicious that he did have the malformation. <laughs> and this is what he found. My bed is falling apart. Okay. So, <laughs> The other thing that can be involved, because ECVM stands for, for complex vertebral malformation, so there's more to just the cervicals. The first and second ribs can be involved. 
we were lucky enough with this particular horse to also dig up the first rib. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually, you're looking uh, head on into the horse. Uh, so this is actually his right first rib, which is normal. And this was all there was of the left first rib. There was actually probably in dissect, if we had dissected from the reports, a filament that just runs down and they connect here to the manubrium. So this first rib is incredibly important for, it's the opening of the thoracic inlet. Diane can go on and on about everything I that goes through. Go on and on about it. I mean, there's so many important structures neurally and vascularly that pass through there that it just would make your head spin. Right. But the bottom line, according to Sharon, I love this, is with asymmetrical form comes asymmetrical function. Mm. Or you can think about the horses that have this, and it's been reported, they do have, it depends on the kind, but they will have um, pain issues, lameness issues, some ataxia, and behavioral for sure. So that's our first thing we look for uh, along the genetic mutation line. The second thing we're looking at is transitional vertebra, which again is a genetic mutation. So the transitional means that each region of the spine has, um, there's different regions. There's the neck region, so here's the cervicals, and then there's the back region the, uh, to here, the thoracics. So this junction right here is where the cervicals transition to the thoracic. So that's the cervical thoracic junction. The next area of transition is between the last thoracic vertebra and the first sacral, or I'm sorry, lumbar vertebra. And the difference is, is that the thoracic vertebra, which typically there's 18, but you can't really hold to that all the time. We've got a couple of horses that have 19. 19. Um, but they all have a pair of ribs and the ribs are articulating so they move. The difference is the lumbar vertebra do not have ribs, they have transverse wings essentially, transverse processes that are fixed and that's meant to stabilize the spine. But here is a transitional region there. Another region, the lumbosacral, so the last lumbar vertebra and the first sacral vertebra is the transitional zone. And then there's the last in the uh, sacral caudal, which is the last sacral vertebra, and transitions to the first tailbone. And those can often be fused. So Apollo had the lumbosacral transitional vertebra, where this is looking down at the sacrum, and the first vertebra, the first vertebral bone is the, um, the, the wing of the sacrum. And notice this looks like a fracture, it really isn't. This is where the last lumbar couldn't decide whether it wanted to be a lumbar, separate, or fused for the sacrum, so it did both. So it's transitional. It has qualities of both regions. What this did for Apollo is it set up asymmetry. He was born with this. And we think as a result of his short life and every the stresses and strains of racing and whatnot that we found asymmetries and pathology farther up into his spine from this. So this is another type of transitional vertebra, and this is between the thorac, the thoracolumbar transition. This is a horse, we actually, we have the skeleton here. We were digging this one up a couple years ago. And we're looking down at the back, the head's this way, this is the pelvis, so the tail is to your right. These vertebrae here are the sacral vertebrae. You can see the transverse, I'm sorry, lumbar, thank you. <laughs> well, lumbar vertebra that with the transverse processes coming out and they're not articulating, they're fused solidly with the lumbar vertebra. Up here we have the, a rib, this is probably T, I think this was T17 or 16, one of the, the right rib, you can see it has an articulation there and then these other vertebrae would have the ribs. But this right here with the asterisk, this is a lumbar. It's actually a, a thoracic, but it has both the wing of the lumbar and an extension like a rib. So this is a transitional vertebra. No articulation. No articulation. So it's very solid. Right. And this is what that looks like, because that's that bone that we pulled out and cleaned up, kind of like an airplane. There's yeah, it looks like a bird flying. Yeah, yeah. We'll show you. We'll show you examples of it in a minute. 
So there's an excellent review on this written by Jane Clothier, uh, professor or doctor, she's now a PhD, um, at, at her horsesback.com, transitional word where she's got lots of wonderful articles, but she does an excellent job of discussing this, the ramifications of of this particular type of transitional vertebra. Um, so I recommend people to, to visit that. Um, did you want to show the C67? I know. I don't know if they can see them any better than what you showed on the screen, honestly, because okay. they're pretty much the same vertebra that, that you have here. Well, hold up, hold up the, um, can we, I'm going to go off for a minute. Okay, so you have to unshare your screen. Just, it's stop share. Stop share, yep. Well, let's hope my thing comes back on. <laughs> well, it hasn't gone away. It's still running. <laughs> okay. Do you want to show new cheese or just... No, uh, we'll get to new cheese in a minute. So yeah, this that's is... my name with Diane. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. All right. You got it? Yes. Oh, cool. You see it very well? Yeah. Hang on. I'm going to make you spotlight again. Spotlight us, Wendy. There we go. Wow. Okay. I'm trying to, Diane said not, but I shouldn't move things very fast. Makes me see so. Makes me oh, see so. Okay. But this, so, is, they, so, this is actually two vertebra that have fused. Yeah, yeah. I was say that, yeah, it's not just one. Yeah, but see how these are coming out like a lumbar, like the transitional, or I'm sorry, the lumbar transverse process, but then it keeps going into rib like. So imagine this is, this is way back. This is, this is where as a saddle fitter, you're counting ribs and you get to 18 and all of a sudden you get to 19. <laughs> and this, imagine what it can cause to the horse, you know, bending, flexing, <sighs> extra. It's very, very close to the, um, essentially to the. What breed of horse was that? Thoroughbred. This was a thoroughbred. Here, Diane, you can have Diane. Yeah. Okay. Wow. We named her Diane because I found we, her and we didn't, we didn't know, know her, her name was. was. <laughs> Yeah, somebody's asking if that horse had behavioral issues. We don't know, unfortunately. That was one we just sort of found in the early days. <laughs> I don't think so. The bones are pretty old, so I think that horse probably had a long life. Okay, so I can go back to screen share. Yep. Oh, it's not there. It, no, it's got to be there. It's got to be there. Oh, desktop. Yeah. There you go. I know be there. Somebody's asking, um, how and why do bones bone transitions happen so quickly? Uh, she says, I guess I always thought changes in the skeleton would take generations. Diane, you answer that while I figure out where the talk is. <laughs> I disappeared again. Well, we, we don't know that this hasn't taken generations. I mean, that's part of the genetic uh, mutation of it. I mean, we've looked into probably most seriously into thoroughbred breeding. And I mean, we know that in thoroughbreds that there's a lot of inbreeding. And uh, the research that uh, has been done that we, we know, for instance, that the ECBM happened in Holstein cattle and it was traced directly to three bulls uh, in, in Holland. And they were able to eradicate it because it, it caused uh, the calves to be to either be born dead or die shortly after birth. So um, it was an inbreeding thing and they eradicated those three bulls and they, they wow. eradicated ECDM. Um, but I think because thoroughbreds aren't dying from it. That, that we you know, know of. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's the thing. That, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But it has probably taken generations for this to crop up based on breeding practices. Um, I, I don't think that it's dissimilar from something like HYPP. But the thing is, is, is the transitional vertebra is a genetic mutation, but we don't know if it is hereditary. The ECVM, according to... Um, the studies uh, and pretty much based on the Holstein cattle is inherited. So I don't, the transitional vertebra from my understanding, and um, I hope Sharon can correct me on this, is that it's just a genetic mutation. And actually it may have something to do with evolution, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> okay, so onward to what, uh, what other pathologies. This is, this is the education of what you look for in bones. So the third option or third character, whatever, 
other non-congenital, meaning not born with it, osteopathologies that may or may not be genetic, but are typically co compensatory, though they may not be compensatory. They could be like an injury or something. Basically, pretty much everything we think we see is compensatory. So here we go. Axial skeleton. Axial skeleton is your, your head, your neck, your back, and your, your sacrum and your tail. Everything but the legs. And we've got, we've got some examples to show you. Um, oh, I can't do it with the screen, got it, can I? Nope, you gotta go back out again. Okay, so we'll show you a few of these pathologies. Let me see what the notes say. <laughs> okay. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, Vanna. So, okay. kissing spine. This, now this is, this is a skeleton of a pretty old guy. So, um, a lot of what he's got going here is old age but who knows if it was old age and his lifestyle. Cause he was, he did have kind of a hard life as far as um, several owners. And then his last owner was wonderful. She did some eventing. He had um, a rotational fall, unfortunately. And, but still he lived to be 20 something years old. Okay. Okay. So can you see these? Yep. Okay, so this is an example of impinging dorsal spinous processes. Here's my pointer. These are thoracic vertebra. So probably, what are we looking at? Probably 14, 13, 14, 15. About where the rate of the rider would be. Oh, yeah. 14, yeah. I can't do this very well. You're doing good. Okay, so see right here at the top of the spinous processes where it's wider? and they actually are touching. Yep. So when the horse is moving, actually, they're you know, moving back and forth and touching. So this is called impinging. They're not fused yet, but they could fuse if the horse lived long enough and was still um, living under the conditions that caused it. But that is considered kissing spine. Okay. And so one. basically the definition of kissing spine is where the dorsal processes on the thoracic vertebrae or any vertebrae are actually touching. Are touching. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a case of ones that were kissing and then did, in fact, use badly. Yeah. So this is, you see the wings? This vertebra is the lumbar. I should point it out on this side. It's the lumbar vertebra. And this is the T18. So this horse was fused at that junction of the thoracics and the first lumbar. Um, so this is called... Uh, not really spondylos so much as fusion of the articular processes up in here and all this extra bone growth you see all over that's not normal this is usually our, our like arthritis um, where the synovial joints which these are um, become inflamed and an extra bone grows and so the the extra bone growth is basically to try and stabilize the system right yeah, yes exactly um Absolutely. What are the pathologies we look at? We often see a lot. This is uh, <laughs> this, get the tags off. This is yeah. This is T1, right? Yeah. Yeah. T1. So the first thoracic. Hold it up close. It's hard. Yeah, you have to hold that up so they can really see how lumpy it is. Very, very lumpy. Oops. Uh oh, you froze. Lumps. No. <laughs> Oh, left so is right and right is left, guy. Really well so now with your pointer. Yeah, got it. Yeah. All right, so the spine there. Um, this is where the ribs attach down here. There's, there's like, it's cupping and lipping. The bone is all growing around it. So those are certain pathologies. Uh, what did we do with those? And so bottom line is we see arthritis in horses the same way we see arthritis in people. And yes, yes. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing is to look at the sacrum and the, um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that, the whole oh, lumbar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's nice. <laughs> all one piece. That, that's not normal. <laughs> this actually, yes, older horses will fuse in their last lumbar vertebra. Um, Young horses, you wish you didn't see it, but you often do. 
In this case, see this bulging right here? Yep. So that's an ankylosing spondylosis where the bodies of the vertebra are fusing together. So define ankylosis. <laughs> oh, Wendy. <laughs> it's extra bone growth that uh, leads up to the bones fusing. Those. Okay, spondylosis. What's the definition of spondyl? I mean, you, know, you hear these words, and if you're not using them every day, you forget what they mean. <laughs> well, spondo spondo re refers to the vertebral body, I believe. So it's spondylosis. So it's fusion of the vertebral body. Got it. Okay. So he's also fused up here, but these are the articular processes. So he's fused up in the articular processes. And these, this is really, look at this bone growth here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is the junction of the last lumbar with the <laughs> sacrum. sacrum. So this is your lumbosacral joint. Which is the most mobile joint in the back for extension and flexion. Yeah, mm -hmm. ouch. Yeah. yeah, ouch is right. Yeah, the bottom of the sacrum is just hideous. Yeah, so. Wow. So we look for things like that. He's also fused up here in the spines of the sacrum. How old was this horse? He was pretty old, actually. He was like just 20, 29 20 or something. Yeah. So is it fair to say there's a certain amount of bony changes just with age? Like Yes. Yes. Yeah, that was the point I was trying to make earlier. That Yes, absolutely, just like us. But how severe, it, you know, can you judge how severe it is depending on what the horse's history was and how hard did they work? Um, horses don't have a choice. We do. If my body's hurting me and I know that I've got all kinds of arthritis and everything, I can choose to get out of bed each day or not. Um, right. And, and, and there's some people where they have tons of arthritis, but they feel fine and other people a tiny little bit and they're dying. And, and yeah. we, it's so, you know, that's where you really got to go back and look at the bigger picture of how is this horse behaving? Does that, you know, does that match? That's, that's their, their behavior and what they're trying to tell us on a daily basis is a huge factor. I'm start to so somebody's asking, maybe arthritis is our body's attempt to cope with excessive stress. So I, I might modify that and say excessive movement. I mean, if, there's, if something's rubbing, you're going to build more bone and try and make it more stable, right? I think both, you know, because stress will create synthetic based activity, which will cause more muscle contraction, which is going to just press everything together. Uh, so um, it will, in fact, stabilize things, but it's not in a healthy way because it never decompresses. Right. And then somebody's asking how you can determine these if you can use uh, radiographs, but I think that's part of what, that's the bigger part of your story is that the diagnostics did not show what was going on in some of these horses. Yeah, it's, um, as far as the vertebrae goes, uh, yes, they can radiograph and image the spines, and it depends on the um, quality of the equipment. Um, so your normal uh, um, portable x-ray that the vet comes to the barn with can only really record image higher up you can't get a good picture of the body at all. But you can take pictures of the body in, in the clinic with a really, really high powered x-ray machine. And of course, uh, MRI and CT scans, but we don't always have access to right. Well, and the key is, is that we be looking. I mean, I uh, was just in Texas at the vet clinic where the osteopathy school is and asked the vet there if there was things that they could see on ultrasound. And she's like, well, I don't know, we don't ever look for it that way. And, you know, so it's really a matter of people maybe having an awareness, for instance, with ECBM and asking their vet to look because it's not a, a thing that they normally take a picture of. So that's the part of the awareness that we are interested in getting out there. All right, for the, for the sake of time, I'm not going to show bony examples of everything because okay. we have the new horses to look at. So, but these are the things that we do look for when we're heading out and, and getting bones. Um, the axial skeleton is asymmetry is a biggie. Um, looking for asymmetry in anything and it's extreme asymmetry. Like we're all asymmetric anyways, left and right is not the same but you can get some very distinct asymmetries that cause problems. So appendages, jar legs and whatnot, osteoarthritis of the joints. Um, we got one um, elbow 
just to show real quickly. I don't know if you'll see it really well on the screen. Mm, this you is might have to unshare your screen again. Oh yeah, well, forget it. <laughs> you can show it later when you unshare. <laughs> All right, so that we look for, we look for lesions um, uh, in the hip joint, stifle and hock, um, indications of ring bone formation, uh, small and large pastern bones, the P1 and 2, and of course, conditions of the coffin bone. Uh, P3, signs of laminitis, side bone formation, um, extra uh, um, pores that can signify um, overabundant vascularity or um, osteoporosis. Uh, and then the skull, we, of course, we look at the skull, we look at the hyoid, a dental condition, uh, presence of any sharp bony proliferations or spurs on the edges of pores uh, around the occiput, we can often see, and again, asymmetries. And then one last thing that I didn't uh, include in this because I ran out of room, but Diane reminded me is fractures, you know, oh, yeah. and, and fractures and how the bone reforms after it's fractured and what issues they can cause. And one thing I thought kind of interesting, uh, <laughs> <laughs> going through uh, this presentation was how much pathology we consistently find uh, in the axial skeleton, for instance, in this old fellow that's on the table, and that their long bones and lower limbs uh, largely look pretty good. Um, that we don't see occasionally a fused hock, occasionally a little bit of ring bone or side bone, but um, we see so much more that's going on in the spine, which is this area that we largely don't look at because it's difficult to look at. That that's fascinating because when yeah, yeah that it's because yeah okay that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> all right, so um, for the summer of 2020, um, let's see, we accepted three horses up in Maine for to that fit the profile, the Apollo profile or whatever. Um, and they were uh, euthanized um, as per vet recommendation due to behavior and composted at the compost area. And then I went up this summer and retrieved them, um, which was very interesting because some of them were only composted for <laughs> six months. <laughs> it was very interesting. One of the three horses, yeah, three horses, yeah. A fourth horse was also at the compost, but he wasn't part of our quote unquote study. So these are the three horses. Um, that fit our Apollo profile, and I'll uh, elaborate on their histories in a bit. Oh, okay. Um, Toby, and off the track, uh, Gelding, five years old. And this one was actually one of the very first horses uh, owners who contacted Eva after we got the Apollo story started on Facebook. And she's a young college student, um, desperate because she was she was seeing Apollo in her horse, and he was becoming extremely aggressive. And um, she was a college student and didn't have the money. Her vet was was strongly suggesting euthanasia, but she couldn't afford very much. And um, so I offered to pay for composting him if she wanted to donate him to the project, and she did, um, which we thank thank all these people so much for for being um, strong enough to do that. So I'll talk about Toby in a bit. Then Makiko was an off the track mare, six years old. And the third one was Cat Talk, um, a 12 year old. And I won't be talking about him today. Uh, the owner gave us permission. Uh, she donated him, but I have not had direct contact with her to let her know what we found. And I don't like to tell, you know, talk about it until I let her find, find so. And then my serendipitous um, recoveries were three horses of very good friends of mine in Booth Bay who I've known for a long, long time. And uh, they just happened to, they were older horses and two of them, Sebastian and Huzat, were actually buried on their farm or composted on their farm many years ago. And we ended up taking them up. And Peppy was one that just passed uh, in March, and she sent him the compassionate composting and said, why don't you pick them up while you're there? So this is Seabass, and this is Peppy, and that's who's at. 
Um, and these are, so we've got essentially two parts to this talk. This part is our project, our study, our Apollo profile horses. And this are the pathologies we'll see in the older horses, one of which is the one we just looked at for examples, all that heavy duty pathology. Um, and also these are horses that even though they had all of this, they didn't really have negative behavior um, to the extent that, um, that these other horses did. So Machiko, Machiko, yep. Oh, she's Machiko. coming. She is okay. Machiko, A.K.A. Michi, registered name Proud Cougar. So off the track thoroughbred. Um, born 2014 and euthanized 2020. Only three starts, unplaced, and her owner um, bought her in 2017. She'd only been off the track six uh, months. This is a image of her at five years or four years old, no, five years old and four years old over there. So I'm just gonna summarize what she told me um, about her experience with him. And I really have to, I'm cutting it short, I'm cutting out a lot of things, but I'm, I tried to concise it. Most of what I want people to really focus in on are her comments. So she started with trail rides. The more work asked, the more Libby noticed back and hind end issues. In hand walking up and down hills prompted explosive behavior. In 2018, some work under saddle in the spring, hacking out at the walk, but any work above the walk and violent behavior ensued. In the late fall, things were getting out of hand when she was bucking me off at pretty good rate. She became unruly in hand and could not be left in the stall for fear of hurting herself or destroying the building. She was a cribber. And that's another aspect that I didn't have back in the characteristics for the profiles is um, cribbing, uh, weaving, fence walk fence walking, stall walking, these are other behaviors that horses uh, will have or can have from the anxiety. Seen by a chiropractor multiple times, tested for common diseases that cause neurological problems and checked for obvious lameness, also Lyme, um, EPM, all that. But at the end of the day, I was left with a diagnosis of behavioral, the naughty horse syndrome. 2019, back to easy work. And when I say back to work, throughout here, she would be having some tendon sprains or strains that uh, meant that she had to be stall rest and then started hand walking. So back to easy work, she had just healed from something. She would have good days and then very, very bad days. I never knew which version to expect and the bucking never stopped. End of 2019, became anxious at the sight of the saddle and the girth, started to self-mutilate. The side biting was impossible to bear. And then March 2020, having exhausted all resources, trying to keep Michi happy and sound, the decision was made to euthanize. And one of her last statements was, the whole ordeal was nothing short of an utter heartbreak. So, what did we find with Michi? Michi, so there we go, show Michi's bones. <laughs> okay, there we are. Then now we have Michi. There she is. Her bones are beautiful. I was that was my first thing. Was they're they are they're beautiful. They're beautiful. Five year old. Um, yeah, they came out of the compost and they were only in in March. And uh, this is the thing about the compost. If you want good bones, the compost pile needs to be really dry. And Michelle had I paid for this one to be in its separate pile and not a windrow. And I guess uh, Michelle said, well, she put extra material in and whatnot, but it was, uh, it was an easy day. There wasn't stinky, smelly and gooey, which they can get. Right. So yes. to keep it very, very simple and brief, overall, we didn't find the pathology we thought we'd find. Um, her C67 was normal. Her sacrum was normal. There's, there's one spine missing. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah. Like this. It's broke off. Broke off. But yeah. That's yeah. in the compost. She has the beginnings. You want to point out of the um, spine. Just a little bit of impinging. Yeah, she's just starting. And she's just starting to fuse the last lumbars. Yeah, these don't want to pull apart. Oh, well, yeah, they do. Now they will. So uh, she had a little bit of that. Um, the one thing I did notice was... Make sure you guys can see this. Get another hand here. See the lines? And the oh, vertebrae yeah. Right here? Yeah. Not, not between them, but these lines? Yeah, on the body of the vertebrae, just 
just yep. that's yep. good right there. Yep. Those are the uh, um, tysial plates. So the growth plates had not, were still not fully mineralized, six years old. So mm. when we do our growth plate story, that's something to keep an eye on. But really, as far as pathology, she's, I mean, she looks beautiful. So then we got to her thoracics. And if we do a count, which I won't do, but if we did, she has 17 thoracic vertebra. So this is the 17th. So all of these would have normal articulating ribs, but she only had 17, little beginning of kiss and spine there. When I pulled out what I thought would be the 18th rib, lo and behold, what did we find? What's this remind you of? <laughs> that other, other bird. <laughs> other bird. Yep, now the spines are missing. They broke off here, but this is a transitional vertebra. So her T18 tried to become also lumbar but still grew the long spine. So, uh oh, where's the other one that we had? Unfortunately, she was lying, the way she was lying in the compost, one of the spines here kind of broke. There we go. Let's just not get her label off, because it's a pain. There we go. So you can see here, Diane's, this is the one that we found um, here in May, or in Aiken. Right. And this is essentially what she would have had. So the angle is very different on it. Sorry? The angle. Yeah. So if you put it together with the lumbars, the rest of the lumbar, see how it kind of they overlap? Yeah. Okay. So imagine just and I don't have a picture of of there's really good pictures in Jane Clothier's review of external of horses that you can see this. That see this lump on. Um, and Imagine the things that this mare was objecting to, and it makes sense. She didn't want to go up and down hills. Yeah. Saddles were bothering her. Um, what were some of the other things? Biting her sides. The bucking. The bucking. So these are things that this was probably causing those issues with. And that one on the on the closer to you, it's a very upright angle. I mean, it yeah. Well, it is also broken. So see here. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think a lot of that is it just dried like that. Oh, 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 okay. okay. You have to be kind of careful in what you uh, draw, conclusions you draw when they're kind of... Yes, it's so different on the two sides, right? I get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it probably would have been pretty bilateral. Right. Uh, the other thing that is a consequence probably of this is on the lumbars, I don't remember how many, but... See right, these lines here in the AP, yep. those are stress fractures. This is what uh, Paolo also had. So she pretty much has those stress fractures in all of her. She has stress lumbar. fractures mm -hmm. through her lumbar. So there was a lot of stress going on holding things together there. Right. So that's, that's the answer that we, one of the answers that we had for um, Michi's owner is she was living with a transitional vertebra. Again, this is one that she was born with genetic and so check off another naughty horse <laughs> yeah do you have her c6 c7 handy yep yep those are no those are michi's that's what she wants yeah oh, you want michi's c6 c7 yeah because you said it was normal i just thought it'd be important for people to see normal <laughs> there we go yep so this is C6, C6 yep. ridges there, and then you'll see the side. So yep. these, these ridges here. So that's pretty normal. And C7. I have to tag them, otherwise we don't know which horse is which. Oh, no, I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> oh, no, this is five. C7. Here's C7. Now notice with C7, what do you notice with C7? That that spine is crooked, isn't it? No, yeah, it's way old. It's left and right, but look down at here. Oh, that it's still got the epiphyseal plate. Physial line is not fully mineralized. Yeah, and that's an area of quite a bit of uh, motion. So this brings up a question that somebody asked earlier: Is how much of the problems with bones can be attributed to improper feeding, lack of proper vitamins, minerals such as magnesium, etc.? Oh yeah, 
we'll get to that. <laughs> well, and or uh, being ridden too young. Yes, definitely ridden too young. Yeah. So that's all I'm going to say about Michi because we really haven't um, thoroughly looked at everything super close, but basically the problem I th we think stemmed from the transitional vertebra. Right. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Okay. Three hours yet? <laughs> no. Uh, we're just in for our second. <laughs> uh, is it cocktail hour yet? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and none of these things you'd be able to palpate really, right? I mean, they're so deep in the body. That's the problem. There's so much mass. Here is the transitional rib. I think yeah. potentially you could palpate it again if you were looking for it. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hers was bilateral, but they also come unilateral where there's only one side yeah. of the other. That would really cause asymmetrical problems. And if, if you stand again this review shows pictures of it but if you stand on a fence or, or and look down at the horse's back you can off, often see that extra lump projecting particularly if you have a horse that's not really beefy you know if you have a lighter built horse that doesn't have so much weight on their back it would be more likely to be able to see or palpate the difference right and we think that the you should have a bit of impinging in the in the, the thoracics that that was Compens compensatory to um, stabilizing for the transition of vertebra. Wait, want to get who's that? Who's that? Who's that? She's going to go get who's that? Okay. So now we're switching over to one of the older horses. There's a there's a reason for my madness and flip flopping from the young thoroughbreds to whatnot. And this was my friend um, Wendy and Alan Bellows from Booth Bay. Um, Who's that? And you can probably imagine why they gave him the name Who's that? Because every time someone would walk in the barn, he'd go, Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was a registered Appaloosa gelding, um, actually bred by a local person many years ago. I did not know this particular horse of them. Uh, 1975 to 2010. And Wendy and Al purchased him as a five year directly from the breeder at five years old. So he didn't have much, he didn't have a history with other people. Um, okay, so his little whoa, everybody, mm. who's that? Hold on. So uh, right after they got him, he started what Wendy called head nose flipping, which I would translate as head shaking. Uh, assumed to be seasonal allergies. They gave him all kinds of meds, Chinese herbs, but nothing fully alleviated the symptoms. I have to t tell you uh, before I get too too far along that Wendy is the most amazing horse person. She has notebooks on all these horses, and she she gave me um, one of the notebooks to go through. She took notes daily for the whole time she owned these horses on everything, and so the information is is fantastic. And she's very observant. She's one of these. She's a she's a natural horse owner. She knows what to look for in horses, and um, so she's on it if she sees things that aren't quite right. So in 1987, uh, because of the allergies, I guess the vet gave him prednisone. He, he went up to 103 degree temperature for several days and stopped sweating. And hydrosis remained the rest of his life. Oh, wow. Yeah. And 1990, he developed cough and noisy breathing after two weeks uh, of being at a horse show. His lungs were imaged and damage was found, but no signs of infection. And again, allergy related was the diagnosis. This was interesting. The vet also noted bridging in the spine, which she didn't quite know how to define, but when you see his bones, I think we can, <laughs> we can tell you what that meant. Yeah. <laughs> 91, a uh, full season of lessons. She just, she did low level um, clinics and competitions. The head flipping continued. And then they tested him for allergies and started the immunotherapy program for the next, you know, beginning of the next year. He was 17 years old then. Late August, more coughing, lungs full of liquid, labored breathing. So she stopped riding, and all this was treated. Uh, she stopped riding and started driving him very lightly. Um, cough syrup was enough to help him, but humidity and hot weather did bother his lungs. Uh, 2002, she retired him totally, and he became a nice pasture, pasture guy. Diagnosed in 25 with Cushing's and hypothyroidism. 
and then uh, gradual decline to the humane euthanasia and they composted him at home. So he had a long life and you know, didn't really die of anything catastrophic. So we'll show who's that spoon. So this is one that, this is interesting because um, she buried who's at in their, in their manure pile. And a couple years later, they wanted to bury a second horse. And so they shoveled up who's at from the first compost pile and dumped him in a pile a few feet away with several, several bucket loads. And then they composted the second horse. And a few years after that, they moved that horse to the same pile that who's at was on. So when we went to dig him up, uh, it was bones everywhere. <laughs> I was going to say, I was like, I don't, are you sure those are all his bones? Or that's the only well, horse in that pile? <laughs> yeah, well, fortunately, he was a smaller horse. The, the other one was the larger one that we started with showing pathology. So we could figure it out. And they were, they were kind of separate, but there were places where they were together. But it was, it was a bone hunt because we, it wasn't like the horse was lo lovely laid out like you get in the compost where you could start at one end and work your way. Right. It was like, where are the we had bone finders, which is just a piece of metal going, where's the bone? So if there's a bone, dig it up. <laughs> so, that was a riot. Anyways, so who's that? It was really interesting. Oops, should I start with, start with this, the spine first? Yeah. Okay. Is he, is he not, oh, you put a rope through him. Did you do that? You put a rope through him. Oh, I put a rope through him. Yeah, okay. but only I left out this one. But and Pam, when you're describing his bones, if you just turn toward the the computer so that we hear you. Yeah, because when your back's to the computer. Oh, I'm mumbling to her. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm trying to decide what we want to show first. Okay. Looking over. So yes, yes, the yes, these are older bones, obviously, but what's really interesting is this is T2, second thoracic, three, four, five, and six are spondylosed. Oh, look at that. Off. All right. So, so this is five and six thoracic. And wow. they're, they're joined together down at the body. So yeah. maybe this is what they call bridging of the back. <laughs> the interesting thing about spondylosis is you're not going to see kissing spines because it goes the other way. It's essentially ventral kissing. Yeah, reverse vertebra. kissing spine. Okay. Yeah. Then the next vertebra is separate but has the beginnings here of um, ankylosing. Yep. And then we have <laughs> oh, wow. eight, T8, 9, and 10. And they are massively fused totally together. And I had to glue the spine on that one. And notice here. So this, get it in an angle that you can see it. There. It was about to fuse with the next vertebra. Yep. Okay. And then, so this was nine, eight, eight, nine, ten. 9, 10. 11, 12, 13. <laughs> so he had three regions of ankylosing spondylosis, solid. This is the kind of bones I see in papers written about archaeological digs and horses that are 5,000 years old as you see this. So his body was really, really working to keep it all. And I kind of wonder, I'm asking my osteopathy friend behind me on how this might correlate at all with his lung issues. Well, that, yeah, I was thinking about that because how are his ribs going to move? <laughs> right. Well, right. In which case, his diaphragm couldn't move because his ribs can't expand to get out of the way. So, I mean, it's interesting that he um, was given that steroid shot and became anhydrotic, and then they diagnosed him with hyperthyroidism because your thy thyroid... Hypo? Hypothyroid. Well, the fact that his thyroid wasn't functioning right. correctly uh, it has a lot to do with the, the thermal regulation. So the anhydrotic part sort of fits in with that too. But I think that definitely the fact that his ribs couldn't move and expand would have been a big effect on the diaphragm and the lungs. Yeah. So in addition to that, then um, we did manage to, our bone finder to pull up his cervicals. And this really shocked me. 
because he has bilateral missing on C6. So he is uh, ECPM. Wow. Yeah, that just, I just, I did not expect that at all. Usually I'm looking for it because, right. because the horse is breeding and whatnot. And we don't, this is an appy. So this is the second Appaloosa in our collection that has ECBM. I had it. Yeah, so let's see if you can see it. So see how they're, they're just totally gone, both sides. Yeah. And then his seven, they didn't transpose totally, but can you see these ridges here? Tiny little bit, but tiny little bit, little bits, tiny little bits. Yeah, so I'm not sure that that was probably pretty interesting. Um, fine. So that. So, so somebody's asking, what would have come first? Is it the theory that the ribs couldn't move and then the fusion started it, or you know, and I don't know that we can answer that question. I mean, Chicken and egg, man. <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe you could look back. I, I think the fact that he was suffering from the asthma. Um, earlier on oh yeah it's hard to say without knowing all yeah. of the history yeah well, and she had him his whole life so it, and, and given what the history the, of the owner she was meticulous so it's not like this horse would have suffered it was five when she got him it wasn't like he suffered you know a huge insult that would have been recorded um you know he just was a horse with what we would maybe say not the best genetics <laughs> possibly yeah well <laughs> Well, you know, maybe he had a fall in the pasture that she was unaware of, and he did something that made him protect his back, and uh, maybe he hurt some of his ribs, and he quit taking deep breaths, and he started protecting his back because he hurt himself, and it just sort of snowballed. But wouldn't the C67 malformation, which would have been genetic, he would have been born with it. That, yeah, uh, absolutely. that would probably, you know, at some point you got to stabilize somehow. If that's yeah. not stable and can't do its job, you're going to start finding stability somewhere else. Yeah. Well, those are the big questions. It's like, was the C67 ultimately responsible for the rest of all this fusion or was it just two separate things going on? Exactly. And there's no way to answer that at all. There's not. Just guesses. Well, it just, looks like he's trying to fuse everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah for yeah. sure. All right, so that was, who's that? Wow. <laughs> That's some bony growth. Okay. So I know the thing is, th th this creates more questions than answers in many ways, because we, w there's no way, you know, we can't go back. We can't go back and look at you want you want questions instead of answers the next two horses are going to provide that <laughs> this was this was one of those cases of you know it, um really being excited about having new horses to look at and try and find things out and help the owners and then ending up not being able to <laughs> because because we didn't know what we were finding so this is toby he was uh this was the first horse that was um, an Apollo profile. This was the college student who couldn't afford um, to compost him, so I, you know, I paid for that. And he was uh, also registered off the track in 2014 uh, to 2019, so he was just five years old. Only six, six starts was a winner, and Brenna got him just because she wanted to have fun with a thoroughbred. So, uh, so she purchased in May 2018, and right away he needed stall rest for a knee injury from the track. And uh, after that, she lunged lightly um, and did light riding after the rehab, but he lived on ulcer guard. He was very anxious, what people will call a typical thoroughbred off the track. In the summer of 2018, trail rides, baby jumps, few small shows. You can see here she actually got a nice ribbon. Uh, and then she took him to college in Ohio, and that didn't go well. Um, he was abscess prone. He had some leg in injuries, and she was keeping him at the university. And they said, "Well, if he's not doing anything, we don't want. We can't board him here." So she had to board him somewhere else. It was just sort of a mess. Um, and then she had to rehab, uh, st more stall rest, rehab his suspensory. But he, at, through all this whole time, he was very well behaved. And she started riding again, and then he pulled a suspensory again when he cantered. Um, 
and then she finally shipped, shipped him back to Maine and moved back to Maine. And in the summer of 2019, not very good boarding experience where she had him and he broke out in stress-related hives when he was out with a herd. Uh, she was able to do some groundwork and then slow riding and then he bowed a tendon, more stall rest, but still he was in good behavior. She moved again to a small farm, got walking under saddle, some groundwork, and he seemed happy. 2019, she decided that she didn't need shoes on him, so they pulled the shoes and put on boots. And she said, this is her quote, that's when he started to act cranky. He started to rear every time she would be hand walking him. It got to the point where if she even reached up to pet his neck, he would strike out. He was hypersensitive all over. And the vet tried butte, pain meds, and muscle relaxation, muscle relax and to no effect. October of 2019, she had chiropractic and acupuncture, and he still remained very reactive. In the winter of 2019, he became extremely aggressive at everything and attacked Brenna uh, during simple blanket changes. She he was out in pasture and she dreaded having to go out to try and change his blankets for the snow. The attending veterinarian, who happened to be the same veterinarian as Apollo, mm. and he feared for Brenna's safe, she feared for Brenna's safety and strongly urged euthanasia. So um, this, this is when uh, I was contacted by Eva telling me about Brenna and I said I would pay for the composting and about, a, this, this was actually a month before this, well, right about this time, the vet called me down here and said, are you serious? Because we have to do something now. This horse is going to kill her. Ooh. Yeah. So December of 2019, he was euthanized and composted. I don't know if you can see this picture to the right. It's her hugging him in the trailer. So she, Brenna came to see me um, after I had, um, shall I say, attempted to dig him up, and I'll tell you why attempt is the word. And she, told, she spent three hours with me and told me uh, details of all the story. It was heart-wrenching, and she loved this horse to death, and she did not understand why he all of a sudden turned. And literally, one day she said she was in a run-in run with him. She was trying to get his blanket off. He, he, tried to bite her, he came striking at her with his teeth, and then she turned and kicked her in the shoulder. So it was not a good situation. Nope. Now, I will tell you what we found with him after I do Peppy, because they're kind of related. So Peppy is one of the older horses, again, from my friends in Maine. Um, and he was actually composted, so at the Passionate Compost. He was a quarter horse thoroughbred, 92 to 20. He was born a bay, and this is kind of the, this is the hint, Born a bay, matured to a flea bitten gray. Uh, Wendy and Al purchased him when he was a 10 year old, and he'd are, he was, I think he was down in a farm, in Hunter Jumper Farm somewhere, Connecticut, Connecticut or whatever, and did some, done some light stuff. So from 202 to 205, uh, Al fox hunted in, trail road clinic, some schooling, dressage shows, but he wasn't keen on jumping. He didn't lift his front limbs very well. When he said he braced his jaw and neck and he powered through whatever they asked of him to do. He, he would race through the aids and that was always a struggle with him. Uh, 26, 29, light riding that gradually decreased, ongoing abscesses and coughing began in 207. You're all gonna think every horse in the Maine is allergic. Because <laughs> mine was too. 29 and 2010, much coughing, tested for allergies, started the immunotherapy. In 2011, the first melanomas began to appear under the tail and a few on the body, one on the girth line, so they stopped riding. And it was right about there. I actually worked on this horse a couple summers when I would go up because we're such good friends and I'd go down. I always wanted to show them the things that I was learning and she let me use her horses to, teach, to show her. So I worked on Peppy a few times and those melanomas got bigger and bigger. He had them on the sides of his neck. Um, she actually, being such a good data keeper, had uh, a chart and she measured them twice a year and kept track of, of their growth or their disappearance. And these things were like, on his neck for sure, were the size of a fist and they were hard rocks. Okay, so um, 2018, he had a mystery virus that lasted a week. He was off his grain, temps fluctuated between normal and a high of 104, very reactive around his head. 
much head shaking that was relieved um, when I did CST on him, cranial psychotherapy. Stiff all over and reactive around the head, August off brain, this is 2019, some colic episodes. In 2020, gradual decline, okay one day, then not, off and on his brain. And then 26 March of 2020, he was weak and wobbly. They let him out in the paddock, but he was unsteady and obviously in pain. So Wendy called the vet to euthanize him, but Pepe collapsed and died before the vet arrived. And the, uh, that's when Compassionate Compost came and got him. So, Pepe's bones. Oh my gosh, Pepe's bones are here. Yay! <laughs> I've got this great assistant, yep. don't I? Look at that. Yeah, just... Vanna's doing awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So Peppy, <laughs> these Peppy's bones did pretty well in the compost. Where do we start with Peppy? Um, he had, for an older horse, obviously he had a lot of pathology that went with it, that a lot of extra bone growth. Yeah, this is probably. So he did not really. Yeah. So you can see with, uh, yeah, I can hold three of them. <laughs> I need bigger it's hands. It's crazy that they're not stuck together. Okay. Yeah. Right. 17, 18, and lumbar, first lumbar, but you can see all of this in here. Yep. So he's got a lot of the osteophytic growth, um, beginning to fuse, ankylosis starting. We had one, two, three, four, five, six. Ooh, that second one. We haven't really examined these bones that much, but look at the spine. They're really big spines. They're really big versus so, spines process. He also, his sacrum and last lumbar had a lot of pathology in here. Yeah. His, this is interesting, his, um, he's peppy. This is his uh, um, axis. So the second cervical vertebra and the head attaches here where the label is. And look at his, his dorsal crest. This is supposed to be concave. But look at all the material inside of it. Yeah. Yeah, and this is where the nuchal ligament actually goes over. So I'm not quite sure what that's all about, but that's kind of interesting, the pathology he had there. Yeah. Do you have a normal one that, to show people just to compare a C2? I don't know if we have any other bones here. <laughs> Actually, we don't have a normal horse in this room. I know, that's what I'm kind of asking. It's like, uh, do you have, just put it side by side. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful. Okay. So it's, it's a shiny one, but can you see? Yep, it's nice and smooth. There's a little bit of a groove there for the nuchal ligament. The other one looks like uh, a mouse chewed on it for a while. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, um, those are kind of some of the basic things. What was really interesting, though, were the cervicals. When I pulled out, you should probably get a normal C5. When I pulled out C5. This is C5 and C6. And C6 is quote unquote normal relatively to the called ventral tubercles or the ECVM. But C5. So this is a normal C5, C5 and C, there we go. He has like bat wings and it's concave. Yep. Here and here. This was Peppy's C5. So it's all kind of. We're missing, we're, are we? Yeah, it's yeah. like all off. So anyways, I hope they can see this. It's really hard to show. If we look at the, it's called the uh, intervertebral symphysis, which is where The vertebra connect. Yep. Here. He is all eaten out inside. We need a flashlight. Wow, but you can see that it looks like uh looks like somebody carved away on it. Yeah, it's all the disc is gone. There should be a disc there. Should have been a disc there. Yeah. And it should be smooth like this. Yeah. And it's not for sure. It's not know. for sure. It's all, this is just all holes <laughs> and all lictic. Wow. And six 
has, this is the end that goes in there. Is all the goes right here, plus extending into the column where the spinal cord is. Ow. This growth here. So potential compression of the spinal cord. Spinal cord, sure. That would explain the the wobbliness at the very end there. Dropping dead, yeah. Yeah. So so this really like, okay, um, what is this? And I've seen uh, what's well, I'll talk about viscous one we'll see in a minute. So that's one thing that we saw, and then really interesting thing. That wasn't the really interesting thing. Here's the really interesting thing. This is T10. <gasps> See the holes? Oh, it, it's that's yeah. bizarre. Have you ever seen that before? Nope. Never seen this before. In fact, this hole right here yeah. is the inner vertebral foramen, which is the hole that the peripheral nerve comes out from the spinal cord, and it is so expanded and just like eaten away. Um, so yeah, I've never seen this before. Wow. So. Okay, theory? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Oh, uh, wow. How do you explain that one? Well, this what I, didn't I say something about um, ending up with more questions than answers? Yeah. Um, well, what's going on with Toby and Peppy? And I put them together because I think, I'm, and this is, this is speculation based on some things we know and research into the literature, but still it's, it's speculation. So clues. This is our CSI session. Okay. Toby, was it the composting, right? So his bones just, oh, we didn't even show his bones. Oh, I didn't tell the story about him. No, you oh. <laughs> You've jumped the gun. I did. Okay, so where are um, the examples of, all right, so I go to dig up, I go to dig up um, Toby. I know, but that, yeah, that's the example. So I go to dig up Toby at the compost place. Let me do this for a minute. And he was the first one. Five years old. He was composted for six, seven months. So the bones should have been good. Yep. Um, and my and Michelle was there to help. And she, she tags the head so that we can find them easily. And so she reveals the skull and she is aghast. The skull's in pieces, just in pieces. And she goes, oh my God, I've never seen this before. And I was digging up the lower limbs and they were okay. I was getting the lower limbs and the higher I got, the more the bone quality was not good and it was like falling apart. So we pulled whatever I could of the skull out and got to the cervicals and they were, they were there, but they were not in good condition. And I got as far as T1 and the spine was missing and it looked similar to, this is another horse. <laughs> but pretty much a mess. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I went back to the um, hind end. And when I got up to the higher limbs, like the femur, the areas of, at the ends of the long bones where the um, growth centers are, were just crumpled, mushy bone, disintegrated. The, the pelvis was in pieces. The sacrum, I could get it out to see that it, I think, might have been not a transitional, but it was, there was barely anything there. I did get C6 and 7 out enough to see that they were normal, but the rest of the bones were disintegrated. And we were, I say, Michelle and I were just dumbfounded. And Michelle's been doing this for like going on eight or nine years now, composting over 300 some horses, and she's never had this problem come up before. So we're going scratching our heads going, why this horse? So what we did is, is he was at the end of the windrow and we, we uncovered the head and neck of the horse right next to him who had been composted at the same time, same day with the same material. He was 10 years old, not five, but he was fine. And then we got uh, Michi who was in her own pile she was six years old and you saw her bones, they're beautiful. They're beautiful, yeah. Something wasn't right in my mind with Toby's bones. So. Yeah, clearly. So we add that to, right. 
All right, so was it composting? I'm kind of going, eh, maybe, but I'm not sure. Don't think so. The odds are against it. Right. He was a cribber, so he was anxious, easily stressed, prone to hoof abscesses, tendon ligament injuries. Aggressive behavior developed in less than six months. This, to me, was kind of the key. Yep. Right. So Peppy, anxious, ulcer meds, difficult lifting his front limbs to jump, braced the jaw and the neck, raced through his aids, prone to hoof abscesses, coughs and allergies, progressive body, more stiffness and discomfort. Melanomas, very large and subcutaneous melanomas. So I started thinking about, all right, so this is what we found, sorry, to jump. We found he had C6 normal, no obvious transitional vertebra, distal limb bone quality was normal. That's the end of the bones down farther towards the feet or the, from like the knee down and the hock down. Subnormal bone quality, his skull, his vertebra, and the proximal long bones, especially at the ossification centers. Pepe, total dissolution of the vertebral disc at the intervertebral synthesis between five and six. Osseous proliferation on the cranial plate of C6 with encroachment into the spinal column. Extensive osteolytic lesions, smooth, rounded holes at the base of the dorsospinous process on the left surface of T10. So these were our findings, and this is <laughs> this is their their history or whatever. So differential diagnosis, and I have I have to put a disclaimer in here: we're not licensed veterinarians, as you know, and therefore not attempting to diagnose. But I always love the term differential diagnosis because I used to watch House all the time, and that's what he would do. <laughs> okay. And essentially, it's just what can we come up with that could possibly fall into uh, the categories of the symptoms, et cetera, right? So this is what I I've come up with, metabolic bone disease. So I'm thinking in, in Toby's case, something about bone cancer, maybe, or something has to do with the quality of the bone not being up to snuff. Uh, I know in people, I, and my, my brother-in-law passed away with bone cancer and it can be extremely painful. Um, so metabolic bone disease is one thing that I looked into and that is nutritional and or hormonal. So here's that question you had. Um, osteodystrophies, defective bone formation due to imbalance of calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. And vitamin D deficiency leads to changes in metabolism of calcium that eventually result in decreased mineralization of the bone. Accumulation of unmineralized bone tissue, which is called osteoid, is referred to as osteodosis. So maybe. This is, the, this is what I'm really kind of leaning towards with all my reading, uh, skeletal uh, met metastasis. So these account for 70% of malignant bone tumors with a propensity to metastasize to bone. Distribution of skeletal metastases roughly mirrors distribution of red marrow. So therefore, it is found in vertebra, especially the posterior vertebral body extending into the pedicles, which would be peppy. Found in the pelvis, proximal femur, proximal humerus, skull, toby. Vertebral metastases are considered secondary as the metastic cells may be spread through the blood and or lymph system. Most commonly, the primary source being a lymphoma, gastrointestinal tract malignancies, thyroid carcinoma, and melanomas. The cl clinical presentation of asymptomatic are as often asymptomatic. So perhaps that's why Toby was such a sweetheart until nearly six months before he wasn't. Um, then lesions may become symptomatic due to bone pain, pathological compression fractures, or extension into the spinal cord with cord compression and neurological signs. This is my source for studying or, you know, looking, this is one of the sources I used for um, trying to learn about bone cancers and oncology, which I know nothing about. <laughs> so, and then finally with Pepe, what about, so the lictic lesions on, on T. T10, the holes, might have been skeletal, was that skeletal um, metastasis caused by melanomas? So, C, but the C5, C6 pathology, that could 
maybe that be um, metastasizing or discospondylosis, which is an inflammatory condition involving the vertebral bodies adjacent to the intervertebral symphysis and their associated discs, which pretty much describes what his C5, C6 looks, at, looks like with complete obliteration of the disc space and excess osseous growth on the dorsocranial aspect of the cranial plate of the subsequent vertebra, in this case, C6. This is from Dyson paper in 2020. She has some, some great information here and, and some photographs. So possibly Pepe had this um, again. <laughs> or more than one thing. Right, yes, right. So the cause of discospondylosis remains speculative. It's in, it is been shown to be a in bacterial infection in dogs, could be trauma or melanoma. So that's kind of where. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, somebody else just said, wow. And, and you know, when you talked about the melanoma and the bay horse going gray, that, yes. that's like, was a huge red flag, right? I mean, it's yeah. like. But I never, I never knew. I don't, you know. I've got gray horses out here, and I've got a mare, my my princess mare, that you know had the head shaking, who's got melanoma. So I'm concerned about, it, and I don't know much about it. But I never really thought of internal. Yeah. That they can affect internal structures, and from the reading, it sounds like the metastasizing runs through the blood system or the lymph. And this, this thoracic <laughs> vertebra of Pepe just. The fact that the lesions are so smooth sided. Now, this isn't a break, or this isn't it just falling in. It was like eaten away, away and destroyed. So, yeah. um, so, so again, um, we can't say for sure. Well, and, and the, so just to ask this question could that have been a melanoma that basically pressed on the bone and caused the erosion of the bone? I mean, so, as opposed to yeah. the cancer cells actually eating it up, just the physical con, the pressure of something growing against the spine? I don't know. Um, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't heard of that in my reading at all. It's usually okay. a caused by, um, well, passed through the blood. So there's, there's blood that, you know, blood vessels there's, put up. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, I mean. Yeah. So, uh, so somebody wants to know why bay turning gray is kind of blowing my mind because coloration is, unless it's, unless you have a full born black or brown that turns gray, it's, you don't hear of a bay horse losing its color. I mean, and that's, do you have more to say about that? Just from my, what I've read is the horses who have more of a um, lean towards having melanomas are those who are born bay and turn gray. And it's something to do with the melanoma, I guess, so the, yeah. pig, the pigment. Right. But they're, but they're, they typically start showing signs of, going gray as foals. They don't just, as adult horses, turn gray. Right. And it sounds like this horse, that we didn't know when that, that color change occurred, did we? They didn't yeah. actually know it. My, my princess mare, she was bay when she was born until she was, I think, my sister will probably correct me, two years old? Yeah, but you yeah. usually see that, you see a hint of that in the, in the foals as yeah. the, the edges of their tails, and so you know they're gonna change. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I just, we don't know when that horse changed. Yeah. So, so that's the suspicion that, you know, so, so this, the whole summer was kind of a mishmash of uh, some answers. I was, I felt horrible for Toby's owner, Brenna, because when I called her to tell her that the bones had pretty much disintegrated, she was very disappointed um, because she said she was looking for more answers and questions. And so Somebody I told asked her we would try our best to try and figure can you test the bones for cancer cells? Somebody's asking. Someone has told me that we can test for density because uh, something about those bones, the density just wasn't right to me. And um, I think we can, we might be able to x-ray someone. Oh, well, Wendy, Wendy Coffin, the owner of the other horses said that you can send samples in for analysis. I don't know what would tell, tell me. <laughs> So yeah, but I think you've got, I mean, you've got your answer in that this horse's bones were not capable of function. Um, well, the, the scary thing is that, that further um, looking at, at more horses might shine some light on is he's not the only one 
that has that's surprising me on the lack of bone quality that we've been pulling up out of the compost. And yeah. the ones who have have uh, issues are thoroughbreds. And I've got to talk to Sharon Lee Davis about this because it's bothering me that some of the other ones that we brought up, um, the cat talk horse, who I can't talk about because I haven't talked to the owner. Right. And he was 12 years old. Yeah, so, so somebody was asking, does uh, OTTB mean it's easier to discover malformations that are hereditary? Or I guess the question is, are thoroughbreds more prone to her hereditary issues? Higher percentage of them have it based on what was found. It, primarily, though, um, the issues that are related to inbreeding. Well, that's, that, yeah. And thoroughbreds are highly inbred. Right. Because it's a closed stud book. Yeah. So that's that's the that's a whole another great talk. <laughs> no, it just it just it just leads us down a lot of rabbit holes, doesn't it? Wait, the, the right, can we one. do a real quick teaser? Oh real yeah. Quick. Well, it won't be quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, so far yeah. I've got enough battery, but if it looks like I'm gonna run, I'll run and get my charger. But right now, okay. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll keep it. We'll keep it a teaser. The problem is, I think we need to wear gloves because he's not fully. We oh, well, you say that, and here I am. Gloves, <laughs> your hands are going to smell. Probably. Because he still, he, we pulled him out of solution. Oh, he won't smell for us. Oh, yeah, he smells. No, well, he can't smell it. We're fine. Glad it's not, it. not smell-o-vision. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, right. These guys are the way, so we have a better background. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, well, he smells. He's right. Yeah. So we, how, yeah, how do you handle this smell when you're exhuming a body? Oh, uh, um, yeah. This maple rub. There's a certain amount of okay. gag reflex happening. <laughs> I have just, I, you know, it's nice looking at the bones through a camera. <laughs> some, some are not, some are, hey, don't have this one. Some are not bad. Um, some are really bad. So Pam, while you're setting that up, I, are you a nonprofit yet? <laughs> are you kidding? I'm just asking. When do I have time to deal with no, that? No, I know, but the only reason I'm asking is you're expanding out of your bone room. You don't have enough room. You have no we idea. have boxes. <laughs> you buy stock and rubber made. Yeah, stock and rubber made. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see this very well. I can't. I can't go in. I got to be a little bit um, secretive about this horse. That's fine. Uh, he was donated to us and he fits the profile he was a warm blood oh and, um he's known by a lot of the local veterinarians and this is the one that our favorite vet did diagnostics on and pretty much every vet he said declared him not rideable um dangerous danger so. dangerously so uh anytime he was ridden he would he would bolt and run into barns fences trees um and like blindly in pain yeah yeah not so much to dislodge the owner but just because right. can stand it right and uh the vet did do c67 x-rays way before they decided to euthanize him um sent him to me i sent him on to sharon and it was interesting because c6 looked normal c7 looked a little odd there was a, a structure of on the ventral side that sharon said that is questionable. She said she's seen it in dissection, and sometimes it's a abnormal um, uh, muscle growth or something. Anyways, long story. So he he was brought here, and we we composted him here. The owner donated him. <clears throat> so she and Diana just dug him up a couple weeks ago, which is why he's so ripe. <laughs> and um, his C sixty seven was actually normal. Oh, but. But let's take a pelvis We pulled out his first ribs. And this is his right first rib. Can you see it? Yep. These are two normal first ribs. Yeah, that, that helps. My hands out of the way. Oh god, he stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so yeah, just pull his, you're a little close to the, there we go. There you go. There we go. Wow. This is normal. Yeah. This is not. not <laughs> but I should hold up my shirt because my shirt's dark. No, we can see it. There's this big lump just below the. There's a lump. 
It's a strange shape. Yes. And it's got some oh. very, very sharp enthesophytes. Which, oh. uh, which, uh, this is where uh, muscle attaches, and we're thinking that probably the scalene muscles, and when they, this is essentially bone spurs. Yeah. Okay, so at first I thought this might be malformation, but malformations, according to Sharon, so far she hasn't found them unless C6 and C7 are also malformed, and his weren't. Then we pulled out, actually we didn't, our friend Matthew was helping us pull out the other rib. <laughs> This is part of it. Wow. This is the other part of it. And Diane, you're good at putting this together. I'm not putting it together very well. Did it, was it, did it break afterward? Is that it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was, it was, <laughs> so, so, so we've looked up some old photographs, some old pictures from anatomy books. And essentially this is what a fractured or broken rib looks like. Wow. And the end doesn't look anything like the end should look like. Right. So whatever this was, and it's really strange bone structure, we, we really can't figure it out quite yet. Um, he had very abnormal first ribs that would, spines are connected to the blanket, which would cause incredible pain and issues, I would think, in the thoracic sling. The thoracic oh, area. for sure. Yeah. And when I sent these pictures to the vet, that's all I got back from him on this text was, wow. So, so we don't know the full history of him yet as far as any accidents. We're working on that. Um, How old was he? Do we know that? 12. 12 when he was put down? Yeah. He, so, he, was, he was imported, so he, he did spend time on an airplane. Um, rather that could have been potentially when an accident took place when you when you look at this which were so this is his pelvis then you're looking at the butt bar the butt bones yeah and can you see how they're not the same oh they're really not the same <laughs> yeah so they go Ooh. yeah and you can't really see like a fracture line if it was fractured it was a maybe a long time ago. So we don't even know if it was broken or if he was born that way at this point. Yeah, and there's some nasty enthesophytes coming off of it. And it's just a totally different shape from the yeah. right side. Yeah. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah, no, you can really, so, so you know, that just leads you to, okay, more questions, more questions. Like, yeah. well, the first thing I'm wondering about is with that rib, do you think that that, attempt to heal that fracture was actually ever stable? No, no, no. Yeah. The and thing so, about, The thing about the ribs too is there's, uh, there's the belief and studies that show that, okay. that he's going back. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs> that, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> that um, foals can awful exper often experience trauma during birth, which results in fractured ribs. Um, and from my reading, the ribs that are involved with those fractures at birth are more, are farther along. They're like six and seven, you know, ribs six, seven, eight, not so much the first ones. I can't really find a paper that talks about birth trauma and foals affecting the first rib. No, I mean, just my gut feeling is that's a trauma rather than a birth. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, but whether, whether the pelvis was a trauma or a malformation that started right. everything. That's still, we're still, that's our teaser. Yeah, boy, that's <laughs> a story that you really want to unwind and have no way to do that, huh? Like, uh, that's really incredible. <laughs> you just, it just opens up so many thoughts. <laughs> well, and I really wish that I palpated him um, before he was euthanized because he was here to see if a, a person could have felt the asymmetry in his tuberitiae. Yeah, it's, it's pretty major. And if a person had, you know, put their hands on either side of his tail, could you have felt the difference? Right. So, yeah. That's, that's, we kept it at two hours. <laughs> yeah, you did. you did. It was awesome. But you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, this is so important because what you're doing is you're putting, uh, you know, 
real hard facts, things you can't, you know, when you look at that pelvis and that rib, it's like, no wonder this horse was running through buildings. I mean, it's just totally understandable. And, you know, how many times have we seen horses where they're, again, the naughty horse syndrome, they're acting out and people are just like, well, you know, just take them behind the barn and beat them up, you know? Um, and fortunately, you know, that, that's the good news is that the awareness level has been increasing and increasing and increasing, which is, you know, that's what you guys are all about. That's what these webinars are all about. Um, but when you see things like what you've shown us today, it just, you know, several things. One, you just realize how kind these horses are, that they don't kill us when they're that. Oh, gosh. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, well, this particular horse, I think, went through a number of trainers, and um, I think only one maybe was able to stay on him. Yeah. You can imagine what they tried to do with him to try and get him to submit to what he needed to do, and he couldn't. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, the, I, I think this is a webinar that everybody should see because we, we have to start to realize horses don't act badly just to make our lives miserable. It, it, they, have, they don't have the brain capacity to do it. <laughs> yeah, that is our true belief. Yeah. Yeah. We need more and more. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I always say that it's like pain, fear, and la lack of understanding are the primary reasons for behavior. And the behaviors that they exhibit are the only ones they have. That's right. right. Absolutely true. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so you need to do a webinar with um, Sue Dyson on the ethogram, the pain ethogram. Yes, I yes. <laughs> I'm going to start zoom zoning in on her next, <laughs> um, and, um, because I, I think that that's really important. And um, yeah, so I I um, I'm gradually working in on people. Surely, surely. <laughs> Great job, lady. So much good information. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys, this has been absolutely fantastic. And it was two hours that was well worth watching and very, I mean, you just, that's the thing is people go, your webinars are two hours. Yeah, but you, you don't get bored. <laughs> <laughs> and the presentation, Vanna, it was a fabulous job. It was really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so much, you know, I'd love, as you, as you um, have more time to kind of work through some of these other stories, I'd love to have you come back and talk to us. Um, and just kind of the ongoing and and again i you know we need to find some way to get you guys some money to fund the bigger project <laughs> i don't know how to do that dissection room i mean because we've got more in the compost that are coming out this winter so there'll be those stories but in the future you know to be able to look at their their tissue would be fantastic yeah yeah so anybody listening if you know you've got a spare few whatever and you want to really help move the science of horses forward and understand <laughs> <laughs> get a hold of these guys and we'll just kicking and screaming we'll we'll, we'll uh, get them up better but it's great it's just really great the work you're doing it's phenomenal and i want to thank you both so much for for spending the time with me and just the, the it's a work of love because i mean obviously that was smelly <laughs> <laughs> but they get to where they're not smelly yeah, yeah they do. we do love it we just we have a real passion to know so we have we do have as uh diana said we have two more um as part of our, the Apollo Profile Project, composting. Okay. And now that you're back home, can people come to the bone room to the, the episode? Just small groups. We can't, still can't do the big 15 group. Right, okay. absolutely. But they can find you at Equisoma E Q U U S dash S O M A dot com. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You got it. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. That's fabulous. And I'm, you know. You need to come down and visit. I do. I absolutely do. I, I um, one of these days I will start traveling again. But it, thank you so much. And just this fabulous work. Thanks, Wendy. <laughs> okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.